turning your decisions into decrees. Hallelujah. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 23. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hid three months of his parents because they saw he was a proper child and they were not afraid of the king's commandments. By faith, Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Hallelujah. Rather, choosing, rather, to suffer the affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Verse 26, he esteemed the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. And Jesus name, look at verse 27. By faith, he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. Hallelujah. Remember, we talked about this many times. Life is more invisible than it is visible. Oh, that is the eternal world. That is the eternal realm. That is the spirit realm. That one has been here all along. Oh, Father God, will you help us tonight? Oh, God, help us, God. We're talking about turning decisions, God. Oh, Lord, into decrees, turning them into laws, God. We're talking about accompany every action or decision with action and finishing what we start, God. This is where we are as a believer. This is where we are, oh, God, in our world today, Lord, and accomplishing these tasks and things that are set before us, Lord. There, there needs to be some sound decisions made right now about some things. I even said in Guatemala, I'm going to have to make some big decisions when I go home. And right when I hit the ground, there's some decisions that need to be made about this building. And I had no idea. But I'm here to say right now, and I venture to say this, everyone right now has some serious decisions you're going to have to make. Somewhere, you're going to have to make some adjustments and some decisions to go with it. And I'm not talking about some some decisions that you go flippantly back and forth. I'm talking about there's a decision you're going to have to make about something that's going to need to be turned into a law. Some decisions need to be turned into decrees a law. Hallelujah. Oh, let's go a little further. Now, let's go back and look up at the scripture. Um, we can see a incredible, powerful decision being made there by Moses' parents in uh, Matthew or Hebrews 11, verse 23. It says, by faith, uh, Moses, when he was born, was hid three months of his parents because they saw he was a proper child and they were not afraid of the king's commands who at that time was looking to kill all those children. But the parents had to make a decision. There was everyone else or many of them just allowed their child to be killed. But Moses' parents, Jacobet, that mother, she said, wait a minute. Oh, no, I'm going to have to to take another step. I'm going to have to make another decision. I'm going to have to do something. I'm not just going to lay down and let him walk in here and kill my child. And she said, no. This right here, if, if I may wind up getting killed for doing this. I may wind up dying for doing this. But she had decided that she was going to do this thing, whether it caused her her life or not. And they took the child, hallelujah, and hit him. And you know the story of Moses, that Pharaoh's daughter found him floating on the, Pharaoh's daughter found him floating on the Nile. She took him in, raised her as his own son, and we could see, raise him as our own son, and we could see that that was in God's plan, that that was God's will somewhere, somehow, because Moses wind up being the deliverer. Hallelujah. He wind up being the rescuer. He wind up being the one to write the law. He wind up being the one to lead them out of Egypt. He wound up being the one to do so many things that we, we could say, I'm so thankful that Moses' mother made that decision and she stuck with it. She turned her decision into a decree. She accompanied that decision with action.
action and she finished where she started. Hallelujah. It's really called in scripture is it's decisiveness. Firmness. Showing a firmness of decision in anything related to serving God. Let's bring it there. That's what it's about tonight. We can make decisions for many other things, all sorts of things, to do this, to open that, to start this, to finish that. But right now we're talking about is serving God, what decisions do we need to make? What decisions do we need to make to make a firmness in saying, you know what? Like Joshua, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. If it costs me everything I got, even Moses, Moses' attitude was, it's going to cost me everything. And that's why he said he'd rather suffer the affliction with the children of God. He'd rather go through all the troubles that the poor people had to go through rather than live in the ivory towers of Pharaoh's palace, hallelujah, and to eat and to drink the pleasures of sin for a season. Moses said, you know what? I'm going to make my decision and stick with it. And I believe right now that the Lord is saying, hey, where are you at on making some, some seeking God decision? Everyone that seek will find. Everyone that asks, Amen. it will open. Hallelujah. Everyone that knocks will receive. Hallelujah. You ask, you're going to receive. You seek, you're going to find. You knock, something's going to be open up to you. You just got to put forth that decision and turn it into a decree. And then put some action behind that thing and say, you know what? This the way I'm going in Jesus' name concerning serving the Lord. You can see there was five key areas that I talked about in the scripture um, concerning following the Lord and seeking God. Five key areas. Let's look at the first one. The book of Ruth. Ruth chapter one. Look at Ruth chapter one, verses 15 through 18. Ruth chapter 1, which is very, very powerful. Ruth chapter 1, go all the way to verse 15. Talking about Naomi, and she said, Behold, thy sister-in-law is gone back unto her people and unto her gods. Return thou after thy sister-in-law. And Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave thee or to return from following after thee. For whether thou goest, I will go. And will thou lodge, where you lodge, lodge, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people. Thy God shall be my God. Where you die, I will die. And there where I be buried. The Lord do so to me and more also, if aught but death part thee and me. She said, I'm going to stick so close to you that if I don't, I would rather the Lord take my life. She said, I made a decision. I ain't going nowhere. Where you go, I'm going. <laughs> Where they see you, I ain't going to be far away. Hallelujah. I have decided, and that, and you know what? I thought, I think about that with my pastor, with Pastor Delgado. I didn't know that man from anybody when we first met him them years ago, 23 years ago. But I knew this. When he was talking, God was talking to me. This I knew. This I knew. And I wasn't into man and people and, you know, uh, lifting up people. And, you know, I'm not starstruck on anybody or anything or not myself and nothing else. You know, it, people don't woo me on me. They, you know, they could have this and that. And that, that means nothing. Hallelujah. Because the Bible, even preachers and pastors and all that, the Bible says one plant, one water. But God gives the increase. And then it goes on to say, and the one that plant and water are nothing. So, I mean, we're all just still nothing. <laughs> we're just pointers. The Bible tells you and I, we're pointers. You want to know who we are? It's only two for real positions in the whole Bible. Point, waters and planters. Planters and waters. Yeah. I wouldn't care if they call you Bishop Fofo or Deacon, what's his name? There's only two positions in the whole Bible. Planters and waters. Hallelujah. And, and God gets the increase. And then the Bible says, and the planters and the waters 
both are nothing. I'm not sure some people have ever, ever, ever even read it say that. It really say that. It say, you ain't nothing. It's God that's doing this thing. And I love how this woman said, no, I'm not moving. I'm not going anywhere. Do you know how blessed my life got by, by putting myself under this man and this woman by sticking with them? I don't carry their Bibles. I don't tie their shoes. And you know, they ain't even them kind of people and that kind of stuff. <laughs> I just let them advise me. I just let them teach me. I let them point my wife and I to these scriptures. And I, and I just, I just followed it and got blessed. Hallelujah. My marriage got saved. My, 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 my soul got saved. <laughs> my house got saved. I mean, I didn't have a house at the time. Took me 23 years to buy my wife a house. But praise God. The Lord blessed me where to buy at the right time, when to buy it, and by faith. And then we've been blessed since then. So let's look at, I like how Ruth and Naomi work together. Let's look at the next one. Second Kings 1 and 6. Second Kings 1 and 6. Hallelujah. Let's go there. There's still some more meat in this. Second Kings 1 and 6. What do we discover from Second Kings 1? Second Kings 2. I'm sorry. Verses 1 through 6. Let's look at verse 1. And it came to pass when the Lord would take up Elijah into heaven by a whirlwind that Elijah went with Elisha from Gilgal. And Elijah said unto Elisha, Terry here, I pray thee, for the Lord have sent me to Bethel. And Elisha said unto him, As the Lord liveth and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. So they went down to Bethel. And the sons of the prophets that were at Bethel came forth to Elisha and said unto him, Knowest thou that thou master will be taken away from thy head today? And he said, yeah, I know it. Hold your peace. And Elijah said unto Elisha, tarry here, I pray thee, for the Lord have sent me to Jericho. And he said, as the Lord liveth and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. So they came to Jericho. Verse five. And the sons of the prophets that were at Jericho came to Elisha and said unto him, listen to how the Lord is teaching. Look what he's doing. Knowest thou that the Lord will take away thy master from thy head today? And he answered, yea, I know it. Hold your peace. Verse six. And Elijah said unto him, Terry, I pray thee, for the Lord has sent me to Jordan. And he said, as the Lord liveth and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. And they too went on. Verse seven. And 50 men of the son of the prophets went and stood to view off afar off. And they too stood by Jordan. Verse eight. And Elijah took his mantle and wrapped it together and smote the waters. And they were divided hither and thither so that the two went over on dry ground. Notice how he made that decision to follow the prophet here, made that decision to follow the prophet there. He made the decision to follow the prophet there. But when he made this decision to follow him at this other place, boom, he witnessed the miracle. Somebody catch that? that see, you see, he followed him a few times and a few times. And he just heard him and he just followed him there. But but there was leading up to something. And when he followed him here, he witnessed the miracle. He saw him take off his mantle and hit the water with it. He saw him take off that little thing he had wrapped around him and hit the water and something happened. Verse nine. And it came to pass when they were gone over that Elijah said unto Elisha, ask what I shall do for thee before I be taken away. In the middle of the miracle, in the middle of the miracle, he looked and he was like, since you decided to stick with me, to follow me, right now I'm going to grant you a powerful wish while the windows of heaven are open. While the window of heaven is open in the spirit. He just bust out and said, I never asked him that. But he was following him 
from there and did hither and did and then, but now he followed him across this water after he did the miracle and he turned to him and said, I guess he's the one. So he said, ask what you, what I shall do for thee before I'm taken away from thee. And Elisha said, I pray thee, let a double portion of your spirit be upon me. Hallelujah. You gotta tell the Lord right now, I need a double portion Hallelujah. of somebody's spirit. I want a double portion of something, yeah. God. Give me yeah. a double portion of something, because I promise yeah. you, that was the right prayer to ask for. <laughs> Whatever Pastor Delgado got, God, I Jesus. want a double portion. A Whatever double portion. Right, God, to allow them to make it this far, my wife Hallelujah. want a double portion. Huh? Hallelujah. Whatever we got, Lord, the folks that we are with, they want a double portion. Yes. Huh? Yes. I'm going to pray for you forever to get a double portion. I'm going to pray for you to get a double portion. I receive it. Amen. Uh, I receive it. I receive it. Of my voice, I'll give him a double portion. Work this day. I'm gonna pray in the morning. I'm gonna pray at five and six in the morning. I'm gonna pray. God, if they if they stuck with us, they walk with us, give them a double portion. God, I wanna see it. I wanna see it clearly. I wanna see you walking in a double portion. He said, Let a double portion of thy spirit be upon me. Let's look at verse 10. And he said. Thou hast asked a hard thing. Yeah, but I like it because he made a decision quickly. He said, you know what? I'm going to make a decision concerning the things of God. I'm going to ask for something concerning the things of God. And he said, here it is. Nevertheless, if you see me when I'm taken from thee, it shall be unto thee. But if not, it shall not be so. Oh, my goodness. The Holy Spirit just spoke to me. Now I understand why the pastor of the church in Guatemala gave me the keys to his church. Jesus, Lord, help me. My wife and I, we didn't understand it. We didn't understand it. When, when we heard the pastor, he, he's leading the 10 churches over there and everything. The man turned around and he said, Pastor, before I went up to preach, I only met the man twice. It's I give you the keys to this church. It's like the keys to the city. He also said, when you come in here, if you tell me to be quiet, I'll be quiet. Whatever he got, he saw something and he wants a double portion of it too. He wants a double portion of what he saw over them days. He wants a double portion of how he's seen and the man is anointed. And yeah, he walks in this and wants but you, you still, you got to have an Elisha and Elijah. Yes. Elisha needs an Elijah, I yes. promise you. It's just the way God does it. Mm. The Ruth needs a Naomi. It's yes. just the way God does it. Hallelujah. Yes. Yes. Because he needs some type of reinforcement, some someone to guide, someone to point. Uh, you need someone to still be there to help shape and mend and mold you and cause you to come on in. I know you got special gifts. I know you got all of this and all of that. My pastor got some stuff I ain't got. I got some stuff he can't even touch. But guess what? Amen. I'm up under him. I want him to touch my stuff. Amen. Amen. I want Amen. him to touch my stuff so I can Amen. get that double portion of, of some stuff he got. And he got Amen. some stuff that will impact the world, I guarantee you. That's the only reason how we doing it. We ain't doing Amen. it in my in my L.A. anointing. Amen. That ain't it. No, no, no. This, this thing is happening because of the anointing that God has put on Amen. him from heaven. He said, I pray thee, let a double portion of thy spirit be upon me. And oftentimes, people tell me, you remind me of Pastor Del God. You remind me, I, when you were preaching, I saw him. When you were preaching, I saw him. And I'm like, hallelujah. I don't, I don't feel funny about that at all. I'm so glad you saw him because he's my spiritual father. Yes. Hallelujah. Yes. Yes. And his wife is my wife's spiritual. He is. So I'm glad you saw him. I would rather you see him than to see, see, see the crips and bloods on me. I'd rather you see him. Uh -huh. see his, <laughs> hallelujah. I'd rather, I rather you see that than to see, you know, me go get the pistol or something. I rather, I'm telling you, I know what I'm talking about. Amen. Yeah. I rather you see that than you see me in some other ways. Hallelujah. And Hallelujah. Let's, let's go a little further. 
Look at what he said in verse 10. And he said, thou hast asked a hard thing. Nevertheless, if thou see me when I'm taken up from thee, it shall be unto thee before it not. It shall not be. He said, but if not, if you don't see me, you ain't going to get it. Verse 11. And it came to pass as they still went on and talked that behold, there appeared a chariot of fire, a horse of fire, and parted them both asunder, moved them apart. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. And Elijah saw it and he cried, my father, my father, the chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof. And he saw him no more. And he took hold of his own clothes and rent them into two. He's like, that's it. I ain't gonna see my father anymore. Remember, when they were brokenhearted, they would tear their stuff. And I was teaching in, in Guatemala. Oftentimes, as a pastor, if if if, if they want to pastor or preach, if they want to preach under me, and I'll never see no tears, I doubt if I'll ask them to ever preach for me. Somebody gotta get that in the Holy Ghost. Because it's a lack of brokenness. You see, Jesus taught, blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. That brokenness, it's, 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 it's important. It must be there. There, there. That brokenness is not a sign of weakness. It, it's a sign that you are palatable. You are moldable. You are bendable by the spirit of God. He can, he can move you. He could do something with you. He could, you don't have so much manhood and machismo and you don't have so much of this uh, of us and our accomplishments in the way. You really do believe that you are nothing and you can't do anything without him, but through him, you can do all things. If and I was teaching that principle there. And for all those pastors and leaders there, those folks was like, my God, he's given us something, you know, because that's what the Lord, that's what I know. I only know that. If you ask my pastor, what differentiated me and my wife from many of the people that have, some were still there, many that have come, they preach way better than me. They sing way better than us. They, they can do all that stuff. They got more degrees than um than uh hot fire. I don't know. They got all this stuff, but they lack the brokenness. And if you watch him when he describes me, he'll say, He's only who he is because of much brokenness. I'm a cry baby. I'm a cry baby. Everybody here to preach it today. I'm a cry baby. When the pastor and them took us out to eat, that last night we were at the little restaurant in Guatemala, and him and his wife said, you didn't notice, pastor, but when you was preaching that message today, every point you gave us, these three points, towards family, making these solid decisions, towards your leaders, like Elijah and Elijah, making these decisions, and the next one is going to be to complete a task, is a making up these laws, decisions in the laws to complete a task. They said, Pastor, we had to make these decisions today, that Sunday. We have to go and have meetings. And we have to make some decisions to separate from some groups and some peoples and some major stuff. And when they told me, and I thought about, I didn't even have a sermon when I walked into church. I did not have a sermon. I had a briefcase with about 30 in it, but I had not been released by God where to go. What was the chances that I would just pull the right sermon out? I had sermons in there from everything from victory to all this other stuff. There's no way I could have picked the right one. But through brokenness, I said, God, I'm willing to be a fool for you. And if you telling me at the last minute before they call me up there, it's when he said, this is the one. And I took it up. When they told me that that night at dinner, asked my wife, I hugged the husband and the wife and cried like a baby. I couldn't even talk to them people anymore. I couldn't. Even, and my wife said, he's going to cry. 
And she just hugged him. <laughs> she, I grabbed her. All of us in a bear hug now. And she said, he gonna cry. So you might as well just understand. You understand what I'm saying, Kevin? I do, brother. You know, know what he's talking about. And you know where, where, what it was like. Yes. And, to come from and go through all that mess. Not deserving one thing. I, I, I ain't deserve to be on the wheels of an airplane, let alone in a rainbow. Man, Man. and, and, and don't, don't give me a chance to speak on something real quick. I don't yeah. want to interrupt you, but I will if you give me permission. Okay. This brother, Pastor Wilkes, I remember it had to be 40, some odd, 43 years ago on August Street in Los Angeles. This brother at 15 years old told everybody on the corner, I do not believe I'm going to make it to the age of 30. And it will, if it was left up to him, he would have died when that guy tried to uh, kill him with a, uh, with a gauge and the gauge wouldn't, wouldn't go off. The trigger was jammed. And only God could have brought him to this point where now he goes around the world preaching the word of God. He didn't even see a future. I will never forget that statement. And look at him now. Only God could have done that in the name of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hopeless. Hopeless like many other folks. You know what I'm saying? Hopeless is like you don't see no way. You don't know no way. It ain't nothing. And then the ones he's sending us after them. Yeah. That's who he's, he's sending us after the hopeless, man. And so we can relate to him, connect with him, say, no, there is hope for you. Oh, yeah, there's hope for you. Come on. What's your name? Uh, I'm going to stand with you. He uh, loves you. That's all I kept on saying. He loves you. <laughs> that was it. Yeah, that was He loves you. On. Yeah, and God had a fire start falling on their hearts and their spirits. My three sons, I got three sons. My wife and I got three sons in Guatemala. Their, their, their mother just walked away and left them. <clears throat> so they had to live with the older brother, Samuel, Benjamin, and Moses. I'm going to flash a picture when I can. But uh, we had just got them some shoes the previous time we were there. Uh, because when we were praying with them, when I saw this little boy, Samuel, he about eight years old. I promise you. When that boy start praying, you're going to start crying and praying. When this little eight-year-old boy, the cry that come from this little boy, his mama left him. And all he got is his brother. You know how a child little boy want his mama. Oh, but that little boy set off a prayer meeting with that cry. The other time we were out there, I said, give me that little boy right there. I want him. I want his brother. I want whoever he lived with. I, I, I don't care. We'll take them all. My wife and I, we took them, wrapped them around us, and we said, no, we we finna adopt this whole, all y'all. They left y'all. She walked away. We'll take you. Hello? We'll take you. Yeah, what school you want to go to? We're going to be right there with you. Just show me what you need. And so I got a whole system set up with them now. And they just met me one time. They, my, I don't even know how they even felt about me. But I know how I felt about them when I saw them. I said, no, nah, you ain't, it ain't going like this. And then we got a little, a daughter, she about 14. And she want to be a veterinarian and, and her and her mother. And, and so we, 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 we just set up her whole school year and took care of half her bill last year, covered her bill for the, the year to come. Can somebody say praise the Lord? Praise God. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Jesus. Man, I'm telling you something. It's just very powerful what God is doing. Let, let, let's try and finish this other one. I start thinking about them. Um, I pray that we all get a chance to go to uh, Guatemala in March. In March. That's when we're going to have a men's and a women's meeting, ladies' meeting, and all that. And, uh, man, you know, them. I know if I if all you sisters would have been there with my wife, <laughs> them people, I'll show you some pictures. Them people fall out in the mud. We was in, <laughs> remember, we were outside for two days and pouring yes. down storm and rain. Yes. And, and and then nobody want to go home while the preaching was gone. Yes. And I wasn't even preaching. <laughs> it was, <laughs> then nobody want to go home, man. You know what they did? They jumped out and started building another tent. And yeah. said, Doctor, while the preacher was preaching, 
10 brothers jumped up, ran and found another tent. I'm talking about not no little tent. I'm talking about a gigantic tent, longer than your driveway. And they start mm. building that thing. And the people just, we all start huddling in there together. It's storming raining. Now the whole field is full of dirt and mud. And then, so they finally got the tent up real quick. And so, so the people got to stand there. No, not one person left this whole place. And it was almost at least 500 people. But wow. then when it was time to pray and worship the Lord, they came running on their knees. Nothing but mud. Yeah. Their clothes was mud. My shoes was mud. Yeah. My wife's shoes stuck in the mud. Yeah. Our chairs were stuck in the mud, sinking. We had to throw it all off and just run with them folks in the mud. <laughs> we just, we, hey, if the mud was good enough for them, yeah. the mud was good enough for Amen. We stayed in that mud about seven hours. Amen. Amen. Wow. Amen. Yes, wow. And God, I got some pictures of these folks on their face. Yeah. Pastors, pastors wise, on, in the mud. I'm talking about, it was mind blowing. Man, oh, man, it was fine. Man, it was fine. Amen. Hey, I said, man. I got to get They didn't know what they were doing for us. Hello? They didn't know what they were doing for us. Well, next time I go down there, I ain't going to have them all this little, you know, this cute little tie and these, uh -huh. these all right little slack. Man, uh -huh. I put my stuff on <laughs> and get ready to run with these people. And I'm talking about they cry like babies in the mud. For the Lord. Let's go to the next two. Nehemiah 4, 14. We're almost out of here. Nehemiah 4, 14. I know I ain't going to get to all this tonight, but it's all right. The Lord, he going to help us, right? Jesus name. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Nehemiah 4, 14. Hallelujah. Nehemiah 4, 14. Here it is right here. And I looked and rose up and said unto the nobles and to the rulers and to the rest of the people, be not afraid of them. Remember the Lord, which is great and terrible and fight for your brethren, your sons and your daughters and your wives and your houses. Nehemiah, he looked and he saw that the enemy was trying to stop him from accomplishing his task. He had made a decision. He was going to build the walls of Jerusalem. You know, it was a record. They did it in 52 days. While the enemy constantly, Sambala, Tobiah, those are enemies. And they were with uh, some other folks. And they were saying, y'all can't do it. The people that's helping you are weak. Y'all can't do it. The people, y'all might as well give up. They kept telling them all this stuff. Look at verse 15. And it came to pass when our enemies heard that it was known unto us and God had brought their counsel to nothing. God had brought their plans, their little secret meetings, their little secret lies to nothing. And they returned all of us to the wall, every one of us, unto his work. You see, the enemy is trying to get the work to stop. Uh -huh. That's all he's trying to do in your life, in my life, in somebody else's life. He's always trying to stop the work. That's it. This is why whatever you was working on, don't stop the work. Go back to the work. That's, the, that's what he wants. He wants you to get so upset. He wants you to get so frustrated. He wants you to get all of this so that the work, this good work that God has set your sight on, this good work God has put inside of you and say, this thing, I, I know, you ain't going to be able to do it by yourself. And I know it's big, but the Lord is, don't stop work. Everything is designed to stop the work. Verse 16. And it came to pass from that time forth, that the half of my servants wrought in the work and the other half them held both spears, the shields and the bows. And the rulers were behind all of those houses of Judah. So Nehemiah say half of y'all work, the other half be ready to fight. Amen. Half of y'all work, the other ready to fight. Verse 13, 17. They which build on the wall and they that bear burdens with those that lay everyone with one of his hands wrought in the work. He said, work with one hand and with the other hand, hold your weapon. 
You see, Nehemiah, Nehemiah was the called brother, wasn't he? He said, look, we need all hands on deck. That's what the pastor used to tell me. My pastor, when I was growing up, he said, we need all hands on deck. That's what Nehemiah was telling the people. We need all hands on deck. I need every single person to have a weapon in one hand and then do the work with the other hand and be watching. Look at verse 18. For the builders, every one of had a sword girded by his side so, and so built. And he that sounded the trumpets was by me. This is important. And I said unto the nobles and to the rulers and to the rest of the people, the work is great and large and we are separated upon the wall far from one another. You see that? He said, we too far from each other. If the enemy come in and hit us right now, we got too many gaps between us. You see that? Look, look at what he said. Verse 20. In what place, therefore, you hear the sound of the trumpet, wherever you hear it, resort ye unto us. He said, wherever you hear the sound of the trumpet, everybody run there. Our God shall fight for us. So we labored in the work and half of them held spears from rising of the morning. Look at that. Till the stars appeared at night. They worked. Likewise, the same time said unto I, unto the people, let every one of us with his servant lodge within Jerusalem. They're like, don't sleep outside the city. Stay within and stay close. That in the night that they may guard to us and labor on the day. So verse 23, so neither I nor my brethren, nor my servants, nor the men of the guard, which followed me, none of us took our clothes off, saving that one put them off for washing. You see that? They were like firemen. They slept in their boots. They slept with their shoes off. They said, they was like, don't nobody take your clothes off uh -uh, except for washing. He's like, other than that, keep them on and stay ready to fight. Why? Because the work can't stop. You got to tell somebody, I got to make a decision. And I got to turn that decision into a law. I said, whatever I was working on, it can't stop. I can stop. The world might stop. The money might even stop. But with God, don't let the work stop. That's why my wife and I, we don't pay attention to anything else but the work. It's either going to be her and whoever else going with us, or it's just going to be us and these little kids we got. But we, we're not going to let the work stop. And my prayer is that somebody would make that decision and say, you know what? I can't let the work stop either. God put it in my heart to do something, and I'm going to do it. I'm going to have a weapon in my hand. And I'm going to have a tool in the other hand. Got to keep working. And keep watching. And don't let the work stop. In Jesus name. Hallelujah. God Amen. bless you. Yeah. We love you. Hallelujah. Thank God for you tonight. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Thank, Thank you. Lord for you. Jesus. Bless you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank God for you. Thank you brother. Amen. God bless you church. <laughs>